I'm just going to um, say hello to everybody. I don't think there's anybody quite with us just yet. I'm going to start in a couple of minutes. Um, I'm Dr. Jenny Hall. I'm just going to be chairing this particular webinar and welcome to everybody who is, is joining us from different parts of the world. It's a real pleasure to, to have you here, but also to have with us Kay King and Kemi Johnson, who are going to be talking to us about Childbirth Choices Matter, uh, Self-Employed Midwives and Autonomy in Birth Choices. I'm going to introduce both Kay and Kemi just now, and then I'm going to hand over to them to lead the rest of their time with us. Kay is Executive Director of White Ribbon Alliance UK, which is a very important charity of relating to human rights across the world. She's also the campaign manager for Childbirth Choices Matter. Kay is the executive director and is a birth activist, author and doula for loss informed birth. Kay splits her working week between White Ribbon Alliance and All Full Maternity, where she works as the business development manager. She's currently involved in campaigns to bring respectful maternity care into mainstream curriculum on relationships and sex education. Global What Midwives Want campaign to gather the voices and needs of midwives across the world. And the Service User Voice campaign to obtain a national picture of incidents of substandard care for minority groups accessing maternity care systems. Pat Kay is a very busy lady and it's wonderful to have her here with us today. Thank you, Jenny. Lovely to be here. <laughs> and we also have Kemi Johnson, who's an independent midwife. She's wonderful. She's a mother to some very wonderful adults and has worked for many years as an independent midwife, a KG hypnobirthing trainer and a passionate birth activist. She privately assists families to wade through their birth choices or to recover from their birthing journeys. Kemi is dedicated to making sure all families are able to choose who is with them during pregnancy, childbirth and beyond. Wonderful to have you and you are welcome to now share your screen. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. And yeah, wonderful to be here with, with all of you today. What a wonderful calibre of people we've heard speaking and such important issues have been being raised and shared and just real generosity of of questions and, and engagement. So delighted to be here. Delighted to be here with you, Kemi, as well. It's a pleasure and an honour. And thank you so much for having us here. So Kemi and I came together, um, what was it? Probably probably only about six months ago. Yeah. Um, but prior to that six months, Kemi had been active with a group of individuals who had come together as birth activists, women and birthing people who were passionate about the issues around childbirth choices. And um, that extends into to so many of the areas that we've heard about this morning um, and, and today, that looking at choices, not just about the way in which you give birth, but the care provider that you have, the space in which you want to do that, the people you want in your care environment, um, and I think we've heard so much this morning around how right now some of those choices are, are hugely impacted. And, um, and really we were at a very, a very pertinent and crucial time within choice um, for women and birthing people. And there's the, the Childbirth Choices Matter campaign came together to address issues that we felt were limiting those choices at the moment. And one of those big issues, one of the huge issues that the campaign is really working to address is the issue of self-employed midwives, midwives who are working independently of the NHS and the fact that there has been limitations on the way in which those midwives can work within the UK. It's been a very, very long path for self-employed midwives with challenges and changes over the last decade that have that have really brought this brought this issue to a head um, and, and to a really pertinent head last year significantly in June when all of the independent midwives had to cease their work. Um, so we're going to start today um, just by hearing from, from Kemi who has been working as an independent midwife and just hear a little bit about what is that? What does that look like? What is it to be an independent midwife, Kemi? 
primarily um, being an independent midwife means we work directly for the families. Independent midwives are trained alongside midwives that choose to work for the NHS with a self-employed midwife. So rather than working within um, the employer-employee model, model, we work directly for families. So we're contracted in as midwives. So we are trained in the same way, but because we work directly for families and we're self-employed, we're responsible for maintaining our own standard, gold standard of care. And um, also for staying up to date with evidence and gold standard practice. Because we're working directly with families, we're seeing them through from whenever they choose to book us in pregnancy, through labour and through the postnatal period, up to between four and six weeks. Because it's relationship-based care, we, we, a lot of, obviously we're going to be doing what would not ordinarily be done should the parent choose to accept that, which would be, you know, um, observations when we see them, palpation, listening to the baby, etc. Whatever it is that they want or don't want, because some parents don't want that, um, but we are working for the parent. So what we always do is put, uh, they are, always want our opinion and we give it and it's always an evidence-based opinion or physiologically sound opinion. And we take all our experience into that and, and that's what we're there for. We're there to meet their needs and their wants. If they're, if they're wanting something and they're asking our opinion about it or we have an opinion about it, we will share that with evidence and physiology. We come together and we're both, we're both bringing responsibility to the relationship and to the outcomes as well. So... Yes, I think that's an overview. There's, it can, can go much deeper, but that's basically what an independent midwife is. Thank you, Kimmy. I know people. I know people that are watching, particularly student midwives, will be super interested in in you and and what what is it about you and your work at the point at which you decided, right, I'm going to be a I'm going to be a midwife. What made you decide that actually you wanted to do that in a self employed capacity rather than within NHS care? Because I found my skill set during, it became apparent during my training that I'm very, very good with relationships and relationship-based care, that I'm very confident in, in my trust, um, my analysis of, uh, of a person and whether I can trust them or not. I'm, I'm really good at that. I'm really happy at being open so nothing is hidden. So, you know, I, I hug and I share very openly where I'm coming from and some parents really enjoy and thrive on that and also I'm quite happy with critically analyzing research and I'm very happy with my understanding of birth physiology so it that made me confident once I was mentored as well made me confident to work for parents directly rather than via the NHS. And, and presumably that, um, sorry, this is sort of turning into an interview. This was, it was just meant to be Kay and Kemi having a chat. I feel like I'm interviewing you now, though. Um, but that, that's fine. It's, um, I suppose, also that, that opportunity to take your clients and to work with people across the country. You know, within NHS midwifery, we work within our trust. Um, but you, I understand it as an independent midwife, have the freedom to work with clients therefore maybe get approached by people who have got very specific needs to them but that might not be in your geographic area honestly that's that's possibly my beating heart about childbirth choices matter because it's the ability of the family to choose i'm choosing too if i don't think i'm going to be the right midwife for that family i will say so um, so it, when, when choice comes into it, if I fail them in any way or I disappoint them in any way, then they can deal with me directly. I, I've, got, I've got no one to hide behind. I can't hide behind my team or my manager. So, and, and that's really beneficial for parents. So they, they literally can hand pick their midwife if they're independent. It's a scary thing 
to be handpicked or rejected or to be solely responsible. But that's why we work so hard at maintaining our skills, learning new skills, updating, reading research and understanding the physiology of birth. We do not want to fail our parents because we're ultimately responsible. Yeah, no, I understand that. I guess that leads me quite nicely into sort of the, the next section that we wanted to talk about, which is what's important right now in terms of childbirth choices. And I, I know having worked as a, a doula that also have has that freedom of the national remit over the last five years of my work, my work's become very specifically informed by loss. So I only support families now who are experiencing either live birth after a loss informed birth or who are going through a, a circumstance of loss. And to have that limited to a geographical area would actually reduce the choice that women have got if they are choosing to have me present because of that experience and that skill. But I say I'm actually I'm only actually able to work in this trust or in this area. Well, then that that remit of choice in the same way. And we often talk about this, don't we, within any healthcare profession, any other healthcare profession, whether that's going to a dentist or going to a specialist um, optician even, or if you wanted a specialist physio that has trained in a certain area who is known for their expertise in a certain area, you seek out that individual. And, and does that is that the same with you with independent midwifery? Do people seek you out for your skill in that way? They do. And um, I've, I've left the country to attend birth. It's, it's not always easy because we have caseloads so I might not be able to leave if there's another family that are due around the same time or within two weeks or so but um I've, I've I've not often but occasionally if someone's worked with me before in this country and then travel and, and want to have me as their midwife again I will clear I will keep a month clear so I suggest that they let me know at the beginning the very beginning of their pregnancies so that I don't have anyone else to look after. So, and also sometimes we're asked to travel more, like I'm quite confident with breech birth that we're not all are all safe. There's a newer midwife who's not so comfy, you know, then, you know, we might be preferred. There's a few of us, so it's quite a number of us that, that are independent that are really comfortable with breech and twins, etc. So yes, we, we are often called to travel. And I know many of my colleagues that do do that. And as we've heard today, there's an increasing need, particularly with the varying ways in which continuity of care is being rolled out. And obviously, there's so many of us that are passionate about seeing that delivered with excellence. But at the moment, in terms of some of the disparities that exist within the maternity care system, some of the restrictions that are being placed on all of us because of COVID, all of yeah. the restrictions of moving that antenatal care online and postnatal care online, it is right now more than ever that we are hearing the need for specialised choice yeah. and just to update on what the current situation is for, for independent midwives. Um, independent midwives practised for many years without the need for indemnity insurance and then in 2014 it became a requirement that, that all independent self-employed midwives had indemnity insurance. Now that was, pos that was still possible and is still possible to work outside of the NHS and have insurance Private midwives are a really good example of a company that are still delivering that model. But what is really key here is that there isn't the capacity right now for self-employed midwives to work. So in June 2020, last year, we saw the indemnity insurance market change significantly, so much so that the only quote we could get for a commercial um, insurance provider to cover self-employed midwifery was setting indemnities, premium indemnities at £7,500 per birth. So that's on top of the fee that then needs to be charged or negotiated by the midwife. Per birth, we're looking at £7,500 for, for an individual family to pay. And that that removes choice, that, that moves the self-employed midwifery into a very elite and expensive market, which is not the objectives of, of what self-employed midwives are working to try to achieve. And so we came together as as a campaign, as a group to look at how how we could go. All right. The commercial market isn't actually going to going to feed us here because they they're taking their data from insurance figures from the NHS. They are looking at the liability that has come from data sets provided by the NHS and they're not looking at the data sets of 
the claims that have been made, of which whilst we had indemnity insurance for independent midwives, no claims were made. And prior to that, there were three claims which were all settled outside of court. So the data set actually for self-employed midwifery is not indicative of the same figures of the, the legislation that is being put against NHS midwifery. And that's not to say one is better or one is worse in any way. It's about saying, actually, the wrong data set is being looked at in terms of what happens with, with self-employed midwives. Um, so we came together to say, OK, what, what is it we need to do? How can we how can we move this need away from the commercial market? Because clearly birth is just seen as too risky to ensure despite the fact that so many other health industries managed to obtain indemnity insurance to practice and have and have that choice as a care provider as well, that actually I want to be a self-employed person. That's And that's OK. That's my autonomy as a care provider. Um, and our, our work now within the campaign is to raise enough money that we can launch our own indemnity product away from the commercial market that is owned by the campaign owned by the midwives and that those premiums then feed into allowing us to fund and subsidize and provide grants and access for more and more families. Um, so Kemi do you want to talk to us a little bit about what's needed and some of the sort of core objectives of, of the campaign right now? Yeah I'd love to. I mean the first one to strengthen the rights of women and birthing people to choose the circumstances in which they give birth to their babies. That's uh, examples of that are quite apparent right now where choice is being taken away. Uh, many people would still choose to birth at home despite the, the parent situation with ambulances, despite how trusts feel about the, 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 what, where they're going to draw the midwives from because they're having a hell of a time managing sickness and self-isolation and, and they're having a hell of a time doing it. So it, it, in this situation particularly, it would have been good that we didn't just have the NHS provision of home births or even just private midwives, that they were self-employed midwives available in the pool of, of care that could um, assist when people choose to stay at home. Uh, so, so there's so many, there's so many ways of looking at that, but we, we definitely have a glut of, uh, of choice. There isn't enough choice and, and for very skilled midwives to be benched essentially at this really important time, it's not working for, it's not working for the population. It's not working for the pregnant population. It's really not working for the midwives. So the other thing, to enable self-employed midwives to be able to provide maternity care that is personalised and safe. So if, if it's not made easy to be an independent and then to be in this situation where you can't assist, this, this takes away from the pregnant population the ability to handpick their midwife. I can't stress enough how important it is to be able to invite someone to your home and assess them, look at look at the eye contact, look at the body movements, ask them specific questions to meet your specific needs. It, the, you, that, that can't be replicated in any other area. Private midwives comes closest to it. But to have someone who works specifically for you and there is no go between, there's nobody that will say, no, you can't look after that woman. It's purely a decision or birthing person. It's purely a decision between the birthing person and the midwife. We need that to ensure that midwifery is a profession that is autonomous and able to support women and birthing people's choices by working independently of the NHS if needed. That's so important that that choice remains, that we need to be autonomous as a profession. When we're working with families, we know all the ins and outs of the families, their financial situation, health status, living conditions, what's, what's particular to them, what they may have gone through in a previous birthing experience. It, to have that knowledge is key to be able to provide appropriate care for, for the birthing people and women. And at the moment, autonomy is being th is threatened. Uh, midwife, in, in many other circumstances that, that, that midwives are working at the moment, they may have a gut feeling, they may know things that are private about the family that the, that the birthing person doesn't want shared. 
and and so they know what is right for that family but to for them to be, have to go and justify it and that's why midwifery was always meant to be autonomous for this very reason so that we could form those bonds know this information and provide appropriate and safe care and then the other one, to facilitate increased choice for women and birthing people who are at increased risk of negative outcomes and experiences in maternity care through the provision of affordable or free personalised care to mitigate these risks and improve disproportionate adverse outcomes for black and brown women and birthing people. So I stand here as someone uh, literally obsessed with gold standard birthing care for every person that gives birth but I myself am um, a black woman that was harmed by NHS maternity services when I was giving birth 30 and 28 years ago and it's, it's up until recently that we've been able to resolve the outcomes of that um, psychologically, physically. I must admit, it's all of this, the generosity of all the parents that have invited me in to their birthing journeys that has been part of my healing and me going inside and really finding out wh why I do what I do and, and what's really important for what I do. So when you think about, when you think about the specific needs of black and brown women and how year after year it's been shown that we still suffer disproportionate harm um, so, we, you know, people look very closely at the mortality figures, but we've also got to remember the morbidity figures and, and the disproportionate amount of suffering that black and brown women go through is particularly important for us that we have access to, to care, to be able to hand pick care, that we don't need to just take what we get. We, yeah. we, because many people are now, because they're being said, well, you take what you get, we, you birth where we tell you. And if, if it's triggering or there's been previous trauma or any of that, then parents are now more likely to choose to free birth. And free birth is absolutely fine and safe for the people that choose it, that it's their choice. But for people that choose it because they have no other choice. Then it's and, not a choice. Then uh, it's not a choice. And, and yeah, it's, it's not a choice. Absolutely, not a choice, yeah. and, and 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 they so they're more frightened, mm. um, which changes the way birth unfolds. Yeah. So so we're actually going backwards with the quality of maternity care available in this country, and there there are people that may not be able to afford to have to hand pick their midwives. So another aspect of our campaign is providing an access fund so that they can have help to hand pick their midwives because we don't think anyone should want that kind of care and not be able to get and it. not be able to get it. Absolutely. And I think I think thank you so much Kemi. I think it's so important for us to know that this is this isn't about one or the other. This is about both. There are independent midwives at home at the moment unable to work whilst we're in the middle of a pandemic and in crisis of need of healthcare providers. And because of an insurance matter, because of a, a commercial market matter, our choices as birthing people are being limited as to who we can access. And there is, like Kemi said many times, gold standard care at home at the moment, sat on their thumbs, unable to practice. It's, it's absolutely vital that we find a way forward. Um, I know that we're getting the, um, we've only got a few minutes left sign being lifted up to us. So just to leave it up, there are ways in which you can connect with the campaign. The, the key thing right now is we need more people to know. The maternity sector know about this issue. What we need is to fundraise through sharing this message more widely with the general public. We've very generously been gifted a single that is due for release on Mother's Day this year, which we are hoping will take this message and take the the campaign into a much wider audience so once that's released you'll be able to share that and download the single which will help us raise funds as soon as the funds are raised we can get self-employed midwives back into care and then we can begin and continue the work of in increasing and extending that choice out so that respect and dignity and choice are firmly back into the the choice of, of care provider and environment that we are giving birth in so Thank you so much and thank you for having us here today amongst all of you incredible wonderful midwife student midwife doulas it's, it's wonderful to be here and to be with you all thank you for the opportunity thank you that that was just wonderful and and i could now ask you hundreds of questions myself and and discuss with you about about 
your experiences, but I have one particular thing to pick up on something that you said, which I, I think some people who perhaps don't understand the the role of of the independent midwife is 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 you said um, about the fact that you are fully a responsible, um, accountable. I perhaps is, is what you you were trying to say, but. Don't you think all midwives are actually fully responsible? I'm going to put that to you because actually we should be. And, and you are for 25 years, aren't you? Absolutely. I totally mm. agree with you, Jenny. When I started, um, you know, practicing as a midwife, um, autonomy felt real to me. But I've been speaking to so many midwives that are working within the NHS that do not feel autonomous at all and feel that if they make autonomous decisions, they become a target. Yeah. So they, so I totally agree with you. We all want to be autonomous, but it must be so difficult to be that if you're threatened, if you don't follow policy, if you, if you, you know, follow a woman, even if a woman gives a birth plan and, and you stick to it to the letter, but it doesn't quite go with the trust policy, then, you know, you, you've got to answer to them. And just the, the employee model doesn't work if you, particularly if you want to work, um, for specific families and specific areas for a specific amount of time you can't really choose that you've got to kind of work with the team and with the team ethos which is led by the leadership so depending on the leadership you know some teams may feel autonomous and be able to work in their autonomy but it depends on the leadership and mm. not all leadership is made equal yeah but if you end up in front of the nmc then you are autonomous. <laughs> you Suddenly. are responsible. Suddenly. It just, it yeah. just happens that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very aware there's a number of questions in the chat box. So I'm just having a, a, a quick look here. Um, we've got Ames here, which is fabulous. Um, Association for the Improvement of Maternity Services have been around a very long time. Um, great to listen in. You may want to share a journal article. I think that they've clicked on their Childbirth Choices Matter campaign which oh. I think presumably is around the work that you're doing. So yeah, so that was that was an article that went out in Ames earlier this year. So that's that's written by the campaign. Yeah, fabulous. Well, do do have a quick Google of that if you can't see it in the chat box there. Um, I've got somebody who's called a Zoom user. So um, you didn't put your name on this, so I can't say who you are. But thanks for this presentation. I'm an NHS midwife who recently used independent midwives to secure a home birth during lockdown and it was transformational for my idea of midwifery. Oh, I've been a continuity midwife, but the care given to me and my family was simply amazing now, looking into becoming an independent midwife myself. Amazing. Well, I really hope that we have something ready for you for when you're ready to make that step. Mm -hmm. Just be so happy to welcome you into the fold. Yeah, that's wonderful. But it's interesting, isn't it, that she says that she's been a continuity midwife, but yet, Actually, there was something different about independent midwifery. And obviously, we're at maternity transformation.